I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Dr. Matthew Sidogas will review the different models for dark matter, such as supersymmetry and extra dimensions, as well as the quantum zero-point energy and chameleon particle explanations for dark energy. He'll also explore modified gravity theories and offer insights into potential applications for advanced propulsion. Dr. Sadagas received his BA, MS, and PhD from the University of Chicago in 2005, 6, and 11, respectively, then continued his work in physics as a postdoc scholar at the University of California, Davis. Since 2014, he's been an assistant professor at the University at Albany Department of Physics, pursuing experimental particle astrophysics, in particular, the lab detection of dark matter weakly interacting massive particles and general detector development for rare event searches. He works on the large underground xenon and liquid xenon based experiments and is the developer of the Noble Element Simulation Technique software and the Snowball Chamber supercooled water technology. All right, so today um, I'm gonna be telling you about uh, work that I've been doing on with a, a, a great deal of collaborators on dark matter, a little bit of dark energy as well as Tim said, and some really speculative ideas I had on w how an advanced a civilization might be able to make use of one or, or both of these as a means of either uh, propulsion, uh, propellant in some cases, both a propellant and a fuel perhaps. So the story uh, begins with an astronomer in the 1930s named Fritz Wicke. He was a Swiss astronomer there um, on the left who cluster found that there wasn't sufficient mass within the visible mass of the stars of those galaxies in order to explain why that cluster was stable and not uh, flying apart. And so he coined, he's, he's famous for coining the term uh, dark matter. But it took a lot of decades where this was not uh, this was not taken seriously uh, for a great many decades until uh, over 40 years later, where we have the work of uh, Dr. Vera Rubin on the right, and she found better and much better and and more comprehensive and deeper evidence that something was going on by not looking at individual galaxies, but stars, individual stars within galaxies and their velocities and kinetic energies. And it's very unfortunate, Dr. Rubin only passed away a few years ago. It's very unfortunate that she, um, so a lot of uh, colleagues in my field think she should have gotten uh, the Nobel Prize, which can't be awarded pos posthumously um, because Nobel Prize was given for dark energy with a lot less evidence and not to her for her work on galactic rotation curves. She passed away a few years ago in her 80s. Um, what was, so Rubin's work was really important. It was looking at the revolution, the speeds of revolution of stars around centers of galaxies. So the expect, expectation is, is that as you move away from a center of mass, such as in our own solar system here on the left, this is taken from the essay, Weighing the Universe by Rubin actually um, in the early 90s. And we know that, you know, Venus orbits the sun uh, more slowly than Mercury, Earth more slowly than Venus, Mars more slowly than the Earth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very well-known mathematical law. You set the um, Newton's law of gravity, GMM over R squared, equal to uh, centripetal force mv squared over r and velocity should go drop off as one over the square root of the radius but that and that's what observed that's what's observed in our solar system um we've discovered thousands of exoplanets is observed in other solar systems but this does not appear to work on large scales um it does not appear to work on galactic scales so when we look at uh m33 uh, for example or even our own galaxy we see that instead of a, the expected drop off as radius goes to infinity from the center of a galaxy, instead we see an increase or an asymptote even or both in some cases. And we can extend beyond where we see stars and actually by using the uh, 21 centimeter line from hydrogen, you can extend these curves even further into the darkness here where there are very few stars or star clusters, but there is uh, gas and dust with hydrogen. And you see that the trend continues of everything that's in orbit around the centers of a galaxy. And the 
Another, here's yet another example, Galaxy NGC 3198, and there's the data, and, and there's the fit that has two components, a halo of regular matter, of baryonic, leptonic matter, and then a disk of, no, sorry, I think backwards, halo is the dark matter, disk, the flat disk is the ordinary matter, and then you have a spherical or absoidal halo of dark matter, you add these two components together. Now, there's a great, there, there are many problems with this approach, though, because there are a lot of free parameters you need a different amount of dark matter for every galaxy. So slide three alone, this is not sufficient evidence that says there's this new matter. This could imply instead that we need to modify our theory of gravity to explain this. So this by slide by itself is, um, is not sufficient. And so there's a lot more that we can look at though. So on slide four here, we can look at x-rays from gases that are between galaxies. So these splotches you see here, these are not stars. These are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars, each are trillions of stars. So in the center of the image is NGC 0507, a galaxy. And in the visible image, you see all these different, um, all these other splotches are ga other galaxies or dwarf galaxies that are orbiting it. And on the left in blue, this is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. In blue, in the false color image, you see uh, where you have hot X-ray emitting gases. And they, they're not supposed to be there because there isn't sufficient gravity just from what we observe from the visible, from the light, from the visible matter um, in the stars in those galaxies. So the question is, what is binding those gases in place together to make those X-rays considerably outside the visible elliptical galaxy and satellite galaxies in the visible image? So in, um, I, I was watching uh, one of those, uh, you know, Netflix documentaries, not meant for scientists, engineers, though, but for the general public about uh, physics, you know, just for fun. And Michio Kaku was on there and referred to how, like, dark matters, like the force in Star Wars surrounds us and binds us, binds the galaxy together. And the, the, so these data from slides three and four can be explained by a postulating a spherical halo of dark matter around something like a flat disk-like galaxy, either spiral or a spherical galaxy like in um, ellipse. So that's still not the end of the story, though, because you could still modify gravity to still explain this. This isn't completely different from the last slide. So why are we still so sure there's something to look at? And that's gravitational lensing. So in my experience, um, in my work in this field, I haven't found um, a single uh, theory of modified gravity that can mathematically, consistently and reliably reproduce gravitational lensing um, they all, they're all able to do the rotation curve. So why am I, I convinced that there is something extra, that there's extra mass out there and we don't just need to retool uh, general relativity, for example. And that's because, so the, the vast majority of, of theories or models of modified gravity that, that I've seen, they can explain the rotation curves extraordinarily well. One could argue even using Occam's razor even better than the dark matter approach. They might even do this, but they can't explain uh, gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing, this is the effect where gravity bends light, just like your eyeglasses or contact lenses, but large masses um, produce a substantial bending of light. Or, I mean, it's equivalent mathematically. You can think of it as, of course, the space-time is bending and the light is still going in straight lines in a curved space-time. That's just, but that's philosophical. The math is identical, whether you call it light bending or whether you call it the light is always going straight, but in a warped space-time. And what we find is that, let's say we're observing a distant galaxy, but there's an intervening cluster of galaxies. So each of these galaxies here have supermassive black holes at their centers, have hundreds of billions or even trillions of stars. So there's a lot of mass in that galaxy cluster. And what it does is it distorts the light. And so instead of the galaxy looking like this, you see a lens galaxy, kind of like imagine looking at something um, inside uh, or through a glass or uh, you know wine glass or champagne glass and looking at um, you know, a, a, a painting through the, through that glass and you don't just get distortion or warping, but you do get duplication. Also, you see the same galaxy like multiple times, like in the lower left. Um, so the next thing though, is that we put this gravitational lensing together with other imagery. Uh, so with the visible light and with the x-ray. So here on the right, this is the 
a famous or infamous bullet cluster image where we have um, we've got we've got clus two clusters of galaxies actually over a billion light years away that are colliding, merging. And what's happening is, is that the visible light, a map of mass from the visible light doesn't match the gravitational lensing map and it doesn't match the um, it doesn't match the uh, X-ray emitting gases in pink. And so the center of the pink blobs doesn't match the center of the blue, bo blue blobs from gravitational lensing, and it doesn't match the center of mass calculated from the galaxy. So again, these splotches of light here are not stars. Well, there's some intervening nearby stars like this in the image, but these are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. So these are the, those are the scales you're looking at. Now, even this is not quite enough because now what it can be argued that the image on the right, it does not demonstrate we have dark matter versus modified gravity. What it does show is that if dark matter exists, that it's not baryonic. So there is still an argument that can be made even with this, um, with this evidence that we still, um, we still don't, don't have the final, um, it is not, it is considered very conclusive, but there's still a way, way of wiggling out here. Um, and so, but what's really interesting about this image is if you do interpret it as dark matter, it's, it's quite, it's relatively easy to understand what's going on here where you have a collision between two galaxies, galaxy clusters rather, um, hot gas mixing in the center. And then we have these lobes and these lobes are dark matter, like passing through the central collision and creating these lobes on the side. Um, uh, Tim, I actually have a question for you before I go to my next slide, because since I haven't been here before, I don't know what the, um, um, what the culture is of the conference. I see that messages are pop are starting to pile up in the chat. Do you do questions and answers during, after, or both? Like, what is your preference, Tim? You know, uh, we typically do them after, and that way it okay. doesn't interrupt your flow. Gotcha. Right? Okay. I, I, there, I, since I saw them piling up, I just wanted to make sure and to let people know I'm not ignoring you. Because and we'll, I guess then we'll, yeah, we'll answer questions at the end. So, so because I see like a little red number and the, they're piling up. So, so you're collecting them, Tim, and you'll you'll read them out loud at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let me continue then. Thank you. I just want to make sure because every conference I go to has a different, different rules. So let me continue. So then we're looking here, we're looking here at the, the bullet cluster. There've been, th it's the classic example. There's a whole bunch of other images like that. Um, but that's still not the end of the story. Cause then we've got something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, also known as the echo of the big bang or last surface of scattering. And this is caused by the universe cooling down until to the point where it becomes tra uh, become transparent uh, to photons that no longer have enough energy to break apart atoms they're starting to form. And so the CMB, which is this pixelated map on the right, this is an image of the hot and cold spots in the universe. And it, they're very small fluctuations, much, 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 much less than 1%, those orange and blue pixels. But if we do a Fourier analysis and do a power spectrum, we see these humps and we can fit these humps to models of how different forms of dark matter and regular matter and different forms of matter and energy, how do they behave? And so what we get out of that is something called the, um, this pie chart, which is known as the standard cosmological model. And in this pie chart, you see 25% dark matter, 69% dark energy, 5% atomic matter. And where do we get that? We get that by the different effects that these each of these components have. So dark matter interacts primarily gravitationally, but atomic matter is interacting both gravitationally, but it also has the electromagnetic strong and weak nuclear forces. And so that's the differentiation between dark matter and atomic matter. Now the 69%, which I'll mention the six, second half of my talk, but I could easily say something um, wrong because actually I, the dark energy, that is not my field of research, but it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's 69%. So I figured there's, it can't, can't avoid touching upon that, at least partially. So, so even though my focus and my own, you know, my day-to-day -day research is dark matter, we will talk a little bit about dark energy, which we know even less about, except that we know the, the universe is accelerating its expansion. Then we've got dark matter that's producing gravity that slows the expansion of the universe down. Now, this 5% atomic matter, you might think, does that mean we only understand 5% of the universe? But actually, it's much much worse than that. Because of that 5%, the vast majority is hydrogen. So about three quarters of this 5% is hydrogen and one quarter helium. 
So literally everything in you and me, carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, silicon, these elements that are crucial for life, biochemistry, we are the sub, 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 sub 1% dregs of the universe that, are, that, are, that come from supernova explosions, neutron star collisions and processes like that. So the elements of life like carbon, oxygen are too small a percentage to even show up in this chart. And then we've got neutrinos, photons, so like the photons of the CMB are 0.01%. Then we have black holes. Now this might not be correct. And the argument goes back and forth, back and forth over many years is whether there are sufficient black holes to actually account for the 25% dark matter and we don't need uh, anything else. So even though this class, the classic chart shows 0.005%, there's still an open discussion and debate in the community about what if this is actually a much larger number and um, dark matter could be explained by black holes. But right now, the, um, the consensus is that's not the case. Of course, truth is not by consensus. Nature doesn't care. So maybe one day we will, uh, we will determine that this is a much higher percentage. We're working on that with LIGO, for example, detecting gravitational waves from uh, collisions of uh, black holes. So this is now by itself, the CMB in order to pull out this uh, pie chart this still doesn't stand by itself because you need corroborating evidence from different things like the like uh, supernova explode distant supernova explosions to get the dark energy percentages things like that in order to fit all the pieces together and there's discrepancies here like in the rate of expansion of the universe you may have heard there's a there is a discrepancy growing between different measurements of 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 of, of looking at it so we know this is not the end of the story there's a lot more to learn here and in fact in the late 1990s this pie chart would not have had this dark energy would have had 95% or 80% dark matter and the rest atomic matter. And so as we learn and discover more, we have to modify, um, modify our understanding. But this is our current um, best understanding. But before launching into dark matter, um, uh, bef so there's still one more, um, uh, one other piece of, of evidence we can look at that supports the concept of dark matter as being additional material and being matter that isn't traditional. It's something exotic. It can't be boring, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons that just happen to be dark, right? There are a lot of configurations that of, of ordinary matter that don't shine. But the thing is, if we take our um, computer simulations of the history of the universe and compare them to the real data of the universe and the spread of galaxies in the universe, what we find is we do get a good match if we throw dark matter into our into the simulation without even knowing what it is, but just putting in matter that has gravity, but not necessarily any of the other forces. And so then what happens is, whoops, I meant to, let me see if I can, uh, it's not letting me play my video. Oh, there we go, missing the play button. So what happens is dark matter on the right, in green, it collapses into pockets gravitationally. It collapses into the primordial wrinkles in space time from the beginning of time. And then it attracts ordinary matter, this gas and mostly hydrogen and helium that collapses to form stars, black holes, galaxies. And so this is a, this, there's a prediction here. So this is a falsifiable model is it shows that there should be some sort of clumpiness to the universe. And when we look in space, that's indeed what we see is we see clumpiness where we have galaxy clusters and voids. And the amount of clumpiness tells us the temperature of the dark matter. Is it hot? In other words, is it a light relativistic particle uh, such as an axion or is it a heavy cold particle um, like, uh, like, like the WIMP? And right now, the, the, all the astronomical data we have in astrophysical currently favors CDM, the cold dark matter uh, model, we, based on the amount of clumpiness that we see. So this bubble and void-like structure is observed in real data. So this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS, and there's a lot more data now. And you see this like clumpiness. So dark matter, just like regular matter produces gravity, collects, collects mass, and produce, and it creates these this clumpiness in the structure in the large scale structure of the universe, and these voids then are created by the expansion, which um, is, which is accelerated by dark energy, the other large percentage. Now, I I, I, I try often. I don't like getting. Um, 
metaphysical too often, but I always point out, as, as I pointed out at the SCU conference, I can't help but notice that the structure of the universe looks just like the structure of a brain, not necessarily a human brain, but a vertebrate brain or maybe specifically mammalian brain. That's always impressed me because if it's not a coincidence, maybe it says something structurally about the mathematics that form these two very different structures and very different scales. So I just toss that out there always for fun because the similarity is quite, uh, is quite remarkable. But now going back to um, modified uh, to modifying gravity is um, so we have to be um, a lot of scientists who work on dark matter with me are very, very passionate that this is definitely um, the that we have the right answer. But if like I say, if you know, if I had a nickel or a dime for every time someone sent me their one perfect right theory of everything, I would be able to have enough funding to self fund my research without having to ask for to ask for money from the government. So we need to I want to be open minded about what are alternate possibilities. So one criticism of dark matter is that it's the new ether. And you may recall the Michelson Morley experiment from the 1890s where it was demonstrated that the speed of light was indeed constant and the classical version of this idea at least doesn't work. And but sometimes non discovery of something is just as important as discovery, saying that we may need to adjust our thinking. So what could that be the case with dark matter, I, 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 I imagine that I hope that many of the people on this call follow XKCD great comic strip and um, and here's this little joke, Department of Physics motto. Yes, everybody has already had the idea that maybe there's no dark matter. Gravity just works differently on large scales. It sounds good, but doesn't really fit the data. So the I, there, there was an idea for many decades called MOND, uh, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, that um, no matter how many knives and bullets it gets to the gut, it's a zombie and it just keeps getting resurrected. But um, it's it's the idea that at very low accelerations where you have for distant stars far from centers of, of galaxies, that you would get a different law of gravity, a slightly modified um, law of gravity, and you don't need dark matter. Now, the issue there is that explains rotation curves very nicely. It does not explain the CMB, gravitational lensing, da, 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 everything else, large scale structure. It doesn't work. But furthermore, we tabletop experiments have been done with with um, with pendulums and with um, you know similar to like Cavendish style experiments and torsion balances. And there's no evidence of this modification uh, to um, uh, uh, to gravity. That being said, we still got to keep keep checking just in case. So here is the latest data from the Gaia experiment, which is mapping the velocities of local stars, a great deal of stars near us. And the, the, the data is a significantly better match to dark matter than it is to modify, than it is to at least this version of modified gravity MOND. Now, this but is, again, is dark matter, I put 99 plus percent, there are no 100% in science. There isn't math, but science is not math. Science uses math as a tool, but there's no such thing as 100% uh, in science. And, and recognizing, obviously, um, where I am today, oh, I, I should have said, and I'm, I really, I, I'm grateful to uh, Tim for his very kind uh, invitation today. So many, I know very, a great deal I'm sure that's an understatement. A great deal of alternative propulsion models and techniques require modifications to our understanding of gravity. So I'm throwing a bone here because there seems to be evidence now. I strongly recommend you take a look at this talk by Professor Sabine Hossenfelder from just a few weeks ago, where she points out now that in the last few months, almost an equal amount of evidence is piled up for modified gravity as for dark matter. And so there, and there, there seems to be um, a lack of the correct number, for example, of satellite dwarf galaxies. A lack of the correct density profile doesn't make sense inside of galaxies. So something weird is happening here because we have tons of evidence for dark matter and we have tons of evidence against modified gravity, but now we have, we have more evidence piling up for some modification of gravity being necessary. Now, why do why do do we say this still? Um, so it's almost equal, but you know that's not how it works, right? Doesn't matter. You don't count pieces of evidence, and not how it works. But what's really interesting to me, we've also discovered galaxies that appear to have no dark matter. So that's weird, um, or a hundred percent. 
And so that is a, that's a massive blow against just modifying gravity being correct. That's not possible because what, the, what that fact shows is that dark matter is indeed stuff that you can have more of or less of. But, but dark matter cannot explain several new pieces of evidence have been coming in are better explained by modifying general relativity, doing something like Mond, but doing it better, like relativistically. And there are many, many approaches. So there are many alternatives to general relativity. There are the bimetric or Janus cosmological model, which Hassenfelder has worked on herself, There's, which has a negative mass in the universe, which says there are positive masses, negative masses, and the negative masses explain dark matter as well as dark energy. There's the work of Philip Mannheim, University of Connecticut, if you are south of me. There are different conformal gravity ideas. There are, that is not an exhaustive list, obviously. I'm sure um, here at APEC, you've heard dozens of others. And these are on the table because dark matter does not explain everything. And so one of the ideas that's catching fire now is that we need to, we need both. We need both. We need a little, we need some modification of gravity, not as excessive as, as we would have thought decades ago. And we need to come to terms where there isn't as much dark matter as we thought, because you need both. You need to modify gravity and you need dark matter in order to explain all the observations. But what's really interesting to me, if you look again at Hassenfelder's at a recent talk, is she points out that the vast majority of modified gravity theories predict a new field and that new field is quantized as a new particle. And so we come full circle back to dark matter. So even when you modify gravity, you're often forced to in, invent new particles to, to, from there. And, and that's not a new idea. I actually heard that 15 years ago, also at a conference at Fermilab. And that really impressed me that even if it's not dark matter, oh yes, it is again, because it, it, most of the modifications of, of, of gravity require predict a new particle. So then we're back, we're back again to, uh, we're back again to new particles. So, um, Moving on now, let's though say we do have new particles then. And let's say we have, uh, what are they though? We've just talked about the astronomical evidence and astrophysical. What are they physically though? There are a bajillion ideas that we don't have time to get into because I want to, you know, finish after an hour to have time for, for an hour of questions. So I'm only going to show some of the the, the greatest hits. And if your favorite idea is not here, just like if your favorite modified gravity theory was not on my last slide, I do apologize. I have to, I just got to be concise to finish in an hour. So I'm going to talk about just a few. I'm going to talk about WIMPs because that's what I look for. Myself, I'm going to talk about axions. I'm also mentioning hydrinos. That's by Mills of Brilliant Light Power. Because if hydrinos are dark matter, which is a modified form of hydrogen, that would just strengthen something I say later in my talk about the potential for dark matter as a, as a fuel source. But I'm gonna focus here on, um, on, on WIMPs and on axions. So on the left here, these are two potential models that are not dark matter models, but just give us dark matter. Give us as a kind of two birds with one stone, as a natural consequence. So the WIMP is a generic, acronym for our ignorance. It stands for weakly interacting massive particle. It is not one idea or theory or model. It's an umbrella term for our ignorance. And here are a couple examples of theories or models that have that produce WIMPs as a natural consequence. And one of them is supersymmetry. This is the idea that for every Fermion, there's a boson. For every boson, there's a fermion. In other words, for every particle with spin one half, there's a particle of spin one. For every particle of spin one, there's a particle of spin one half. And this is problematic, though, because um, you know we were hoping to have discovered it. Well, originally in the 1980s, Large Hadron Collider hasn't seen anything. And so supersymmetry, um, while not quite dead, many say is dead, is in real trouble. But it's still, why is it still going? Because it does have a lot of elegance to the idea mathematically, partially, like I don't care about supersymmetry for the sake of supersymmetry. I have no dog in that race because I don't care what dark matter is. I just want to find it. Um, or if it's not there and if it's modified gravity, I want to know that too. I want to know that, or is it a combination? But this is one of the prevailing ideas is that is the supersymmetry where you have these shadow particles, these super partners, which have more mass than the, original part, or than the original particles who they're paired with, like quarks and squarks and things like that. Now, 
why this idea is so elegant, even though it has no evidence uh, yet from an anywhere, is because this is a very analogous to something we already know and love, which is antimatter, you know, that we discovered in the 1930s. And so antimatter is analogous, except for antimatter, same electric charge, same mass, I'm sorry, same mass, opposite electric charge. And so here the idea is different spin, but unequal mass. It's a broken symmetry in order to explain why we haven't observed this already. And th this idea gives you heavy new particles. So it gives you natural dark matter candidates. That's not my favorite, actually. I prefer actually a, a sort of maybe a better potential explanation or a source of WIMPs is extra dimensions. So on the lower left, if we imagine that there are extra dimensions beyond XYZ length with height. A good analogy is you're looking at a garden hose and from far away, garden hose looks one dimensional. You look closer, you realize, oh, it has thickness, it's two dimensional. But then you look really close, you realize it's three dimensional, it's a cylinder, it's a 2D surface curled, curled up. So it's a flat surface, but curled up in a third dimension. So similarly, in order to explain why we haven't observed these extra dimensions macroscopically, is there's this idea this is called. This goes back to Kaluza Klein, um, uh, whom I really love. I especially love Kaluza, which is actually Kawuja, which means puddle in Polish. I'm a Polish American, so I really like um, um, uh, Kaluza or Kawuja. And when the idea here is, is though that the extra dimension to explain why we haven't observed it is curled up. It is. It is not just just like the traditional three spatial dimensions. It's not infinite in all directions and, and flat and linear, but has some sort of uh, curvature, such as a cylindrical geometry um, as illustrated here. And the consequence of that mathematically in quantum mechanics is that you would have a bunch of extra particles and that's called the Kaluza Klein tower. And the lowest rung on that tower, just like with supersymmetry could give you a stable particle, a stable new particle that could explain uh, dark matter could be, uh, could be a wimp. Now, completely separate from wimps on the right is the idea is that we have axions, which is a very different type of particle to explain dark matter where we have very light particles. They're, they're not very heavy, they're very light, and they interact with gammas or other forms of light with, with radio waves or thermal and different um, wavelengths and, and uh, energies of light. And uh, the way we look for axions are with RF cavities or microwave cavities. Um, and so I've often wondered, like, so for example, with the, um, due to the similarity of axion experiments with some of the like um, EM um, pulse, you know, thruster experiments, I wonder if, if, you know, some sort of coupling to an axion field might be involved to explain, to explain it because of the incredible similarities between the EM thruster designs and the detectors for, for axions. And now I want to emphasize, like I was saying with modified gravity, all of this could be correct. And it's because we might be oversimplifying, right? Dark matter does not have to just be one particle. It could be several different particles. I mean, why not? I mean, look at the standard model. We got quark this and lepton that and quarks come together and make protons and neutrons. And we have a whole periodic table. There could be an entire periodic table of dark matter. So a lot of, I know, theoretical physicists whom I know, I'm not a theorist, I'm an experimentalist. I have a, a screwdriver and a hammer and a wrench. I work in, in the lab. I'm not a theoretical physicist, but I know one of my, many of my colleagues in theoretical physics are, are often pushing for like their one idea and I'm starting to think that maybe we maybe dark matter is a rich sector and it's multiple and maybe all of these ideas are partially correct um, including uh, you know extra dimensions but let's focus in on because it's the focus of my own research let's zero in on that one dark matter particle candidate called the wimp how do we look for it so we have different detection strategies. The main one is to look for what's called nuclear recoil. So you're waiting for one of these dark matter WIMP particles, if it's made of WIMPs, to come and bump into one of the nuclei uh, in, in your detector. Many different elements we use, xenon, germanium, argon, they all have different pluses and minuses as detection technologies. But the idea here is basically waiting for a billiard ball collision, waiting for dark matter come and knock into a nucleus in your detector. And that's called direct detection, direct detection. And that's what I've circled in red here. That's where you're waiting for dark matter to bump in to some sort of standard model particles like protons or neutrons in a nucleus. That is not the only way though to look for WIMP dark matter. There's also direct production that's at the LHC where we bang 
particles together and try to make new ones from the energy from those collisions because of e equals mc squared you can create new mass new particles from the energy of those collisions and then there's indirect observations where we look for dark matter to annihilate with anti-dark matter there's antimatter for dark matter just like ordinary matter you've got and matter and anti and dark matter and anti-dark matter and what if they come together they could produce gamma rays, neutrinos. And so indirect observation is where we look for evidence, looking at the center of our galaxy, looking at other galaxies, looking at places of high gravity where we think dark matter should collect and looking for gamma rays, neutrinos, et cetera, that would be consistent with some sort of dark matter signature based on different versions of the WIMP paradigm from supersymmetry or from Kaluza Klein. So, but I'm gonna, because that's what I work on, I'm gonna zero in on direct detection. And the trick with direct detection is it, ha it has the advantage of being the most model independent. So direct detection does not require that dark matter is this or that. It's supersymmetry or Kaluza Klein or this. It is one of the most gener generic search techniques because you're just, you just stick your detector underground and wait for something to bump, something to go bump in the night, something extra beyond all the naturally occurring radioactive backgrounds. But the disadvantage then of the direct detection approach is how do you know it's dark matter? And how do you know it's not naturally occurring radioactivity in your detector? And the good news is, is that most of the naturally occurring radioactivity is gonna interact with the electron cloud. So like gamma rays from the uranium thorium chain, betas, things like that, are gonna primarily interact with the electrons, not with the nucleus. And so that's one of the ways we disambiguate signal from noise, from background, is to differentiate between nuclear recoil versus electron recoil. So we think a dark matter wimp may, we may do nuclear recoil, but not electron recoil. That could be wrong though. So we do have experiments also looking for electron recoil. You see in my cartoon in the upper right, we wanna make sure we don't miss the, miss the boat. And so there are many different techniques. I don't have time to get into all of them, even within this one category of direct detection, there are a great many subcategories. So the experiment that I worked on for the last couple, um, for the last uh, decade, which has now been replaced by a bigger, better version of it is of itself is called Lux. So this is where you take a, a tank of liquid xenon, you place it underground. And the reason why liquid xenon is so great is because it interacts with radiation. And when a particle enters the liquid xenon, it produces light, scintillation light through a physical chemical process in the xenon of atomic excitation, de-excitation, and ionization. It's not obvious, it's far from the only substance that does that. All the other noble elements do it as well. Plastics, some organics have this property of so-called scintillation. So it's a very, very handy property though um, for not just dark matter detection, but anything. And I, it's funny, it's actually a huge coincidence. I think xenon is being considered, I'm sure you all on this call Sure, probably know that forwards and back. Xenon is being considered by NASA for ion engines. So actually, it's really funny because our my experiments, we have to compete with NASA sometimes. Well, we were worried we'd have to, but I think that project was killed, that we'd have to compete with NASA to buy tons of xenon. We wanted to look for dark matter. And they want it for engines. And um, and so, th but so there's only the world production of xenon is only a uh, I think 40 tons a year, because uh, it's unlike argon, it's a very, very small fraction of our of the atmosphere. So the Lux detector was about 300 kilograms of liquid xenon. And the, there's a video that I'm going to play on the left, but on the right, that's a picture of me with one of my former students and postdocs, Jeremy Mock in the green hat. That's us in front of the Lux detector, which is basically a giant thermos in order to keep the liquid xenon cold. It's not it's not as cold as liquid nitrogen, but it's pretty damn cold by about negative 100 degrees centigrade, uh, or at least you need to get, depending on the pressure, you need to get at least to negative 90 to liquefy um, xenon at any reasonable pressure. And so that's a giant thermos. It's called a cryostat. It's made out of uh, titanium. And it's, so it's double walled. And that's where we, where it's, we liquefy our liquid xenon. And so the, um, let me play the video on the left. The concept here is, is that you wait for dark matter to come bump into one of the xenon atoms. This, this whole vat of liquid xenon is under an electric field, which I'll explain why, why that's necessary. So you have PMTs, photomultiplier tubes that are gonna look for the ultraviolet scintillation light from the xenon. So the idea here is this dark matter's coming along and the idea is it hits a xenon atom. You get this flash of light that is detected primarily in the bottom. 
But then you don't just have a flash of light. You also have electrons that are completely loosened and are liberated and then dragged by the electric field up to the top, where in the gas phase, they produce a second flash of light. So the time between the two flashes of light gives you the depth. The hit pattern tells you the radial position. So you have 3D position reconstruction. And the amount of light generated tells you the energy of the interaction. So that's the basic principle. This is only one of dozens of experiments around the globe. We've got a competing experiment in Europe. And um, I heard... Um, I don't remember who, you know, I, when I called in a few minutes early, discussion was about China. China has an, has an identical experiment to, to the one I'm working on called Panda X. Same idea, liquid xenon underground in China. And so this photo taken of me with my, with my colleague, Jeremy, we are nearly a mile underground in South Dakota in a former gold mine. We have to go underground because we need to get away from naturally occurring radiation like cosmic rays. The idea is, is that dark matter should pass through the rock, but that written ordinary radiation will have a very tough time getting through a mile of rock um, in order to, uh, to reach the detector. So we know how to look for dark matter, even though we haven't found it yet, we have dozens of ideas. If this technology doesn't work, we have a hundred others. But how do we make it practical? So how, what, what, we have not found anything yet. So why do we keep looking? We keep looking because of the motivation from astronomy, from astronomy, astrophysics, because we can do a hundred, a thousand, maybe not a thousand, but a great deal of dark matter experiments can be done for the cost of you know, one missile in the Department of Defense inventory or for the cost of the of a, of a large co a particle collider, you could do hundreds of dark matter experiments for that cost. So there are a lot of small, I don't know if I'd call them tabletop anymore because we are getting to the ton scale, but you know, they're my height, you know, these experiments, you know, liquid xenon is very dense. So these are small experiments that can have a lot of impact with, with, with a fraction of the effort of several other um, uh, uh, thrusts in particle physics, which, ha which have their own value. Of course, I'm not going to, I'm not going to crap on my colleagues who work on the billion dollar collider, but this isn't a billion dollar collider. You can build these really small experiments like Lux and L Z and they haven't found anything though is the downside so we the results from our experiments are put in graphs like in the upper left you have experiment a b c and we're just measuring zero with increasing precision so far so on the y-axis is the log of the interaction strength or the cross-section of interaction and the x-axis is the mass because we don't know what the mass is, so that's a free parameter. And so we have experiment A, B, C, so the experiments keep going lower and lower. And if you find something, then you put a blob um, on these axes in this parameter space. There goes your blob for where you think the mass and interaction strength is. Every single detection that's been claimed so far, though, has unfortunately been disproven has, or has not been reproduced at least. So every claim of positive detection of dark matter has been crossed by one of the, these lines that's, that have found nothing. And many versions of supersymmetry have been killed off. Um, and I know I have colleagues in theoretical physics who are not happy. And I'm like, well, they're like, you, you killed my beautiful model. I'm like, well, your model didn't describe reality. Sorry, you didn't find anything. And so we keep looking deeper and deeper. And this is the cartoon on the left. But on the right is a real version of this plot. And so these lines up here are old experiments. And then the lines, the lowest lines here are projections of the next generation experiments like LZ that I work on that are taking over from Lux. And this orange you see here, that's when you, you build your dark matter experiments so big that unfortunately for you, it becomes a neutrino experiment. So neutrinos are awesome. There have been tons of Nobel Prizes for neutrinos. But the problem is, if you're looking for dark matter, you don't want neutrinos getting in the way. So the problem is, if you build a large enough experiment to look for dark matter, you start to get overwhelmed by the signal from, the signal from neutrinos. So we do kind of have a natural stopping point, uh, assuming we don't have a clever idea to improve the technology. It, we may be done in 10 or 20 years. Where not, where we've either not found we've either found dark matter, or we've demonstrated that if dark matter exists, it is beyond human capability, at least as far as we know now, to be able to conclusively detect it in the lab. But now, what will we do with this if we found dark matter? So, my big idea that's tied into um, 
propulsion is why not gather it up to use as a propellant? So there's so much of it. So simple momentum transfer maybe as with a rocket, uh, because dark matter is invisible it would look like a craft is violating the known laws of physics, but it isn't really. You would see propulsion without a propellant. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So you seemingly violating conservation of momentum, but you're not. It's just that your propellant is invisible to human sensors, to our current technology. So the idea is though, I'm going out on a limb. This propellant idea is very speculative, very speculative. I have to emphasize, like I said, I didn't, I, you know, I was, I was hesitant to accept Tim's invitation today because I don't work on propulsion. I'm being completely honest with you. I just, I work on looking for dark matter, uh, but I just happen to also have this crazy idea that if we knew what it was and we could harness it, couldn't it be a uh, propellant just by expelling it? Now, could it also be a fuel? Maybe. Probably not because it probably only interacts gravitationally, but what if it does have some sort of weak other kinds of interactions I mentioned earlier that could be a rich dark sector of many different kinds of particles. So I think that should be on the table. The big if though is the number density of dark matter is unknown. So even though it's 25% of that pie chart, that might not be enough for it to be a useful propellant because the energy density is only 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter in the Milky Way. So one GeV is one proton. So that's pretty pathetic. So even though there's th this density is quintuple that of ordinary matter, which is primarily hydrogen, this is still not very much. So 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter might be a lot if dark matter is very light or if dark matter is very heavy, then 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter could mean there's one dark matter particle in my room and there's one out by Pluto's orbit and it averages out to 0 0.3. And so the problem is, is we know the energy density, but we don't know the mass density because we don't know the mass. So we don't know the number density. We know the energy density. We don't know the number density. So another problem is it almost does not interact at all. So how would you collect it? You can't collect it electrically because it's most likely electrically neutral because if it wasn't, we would see a different structure of the universe. We would see a, very, a different clumping of galaxies if there was some charge to dark matter. Now, there are ideas like so-called milli-charged dark matter, the idea that dark matter is electrically charged but very, has a very low fractional charge. But the vast majority of dark matter models uh, suggest that it would be electrically neutral. How would you gather it? So that's a big, big question. So now I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to switch gears to dark energy that elephant of the room of 69%. So what the heck is this? So the idea here stems all the way back to Albert Einstein, who was uncomfortable with the idea of a dynamic universe. So the Big Bang Theory was originally originally invented by um, a Catholic priest, actually, Father Georges-Henri uh, George Lemaitre, not by Einstein. Einstein thought that the Big Bang was a stupid, terrible idea um, until uh, he was slowly convinced. So the, um, the idea though, that Einstein tried to fudge things though with something called the cosmological constant to make the universe not expand. Uh, Einstein, he, Einstein called this his greatest blunder, but then in the late 1990s, Einstein gets the last laugh because it when we look very far away and very carefully at the expansion rate of the universe in the late 90s, start with an unprecedented precision. Um, at that time, we found evidence for the acceleration of the universe, ex, uh, the, the, ex, the rate of cosmic expansion accelerating. And so dark energy is the terminology for our ignorance. So dark energy is not its own hypothesis. It is just a label for our ignorance. We don't know what is causing this. The prevailing idea though is zero point energy where you have a material that has what's called an equation of state W of negative one. What does negative one mean? It means that the ratio of the pressure P to the mass density rho of this material is negative. So that, for example, it, it, it follows the opposite of Newton's third law. If you push it, 
it doesn't push back. It, it sucks you in. It's like reverse. It's like a reverse Newton's third law um, that dark energy follows. Very, very strange. Um, and if W is not exactly equal to minus one, then we devolve into these other scenarios where the universe uh, uh, recollapses. That's called a big crunch. Or if W is less than negative one, we have an even worse, more runaway expansion. Our current best data, though, says it's like it's negative 1.000. And so that's why the prevailing theory is that dark energy is the same thing as quantum zero point energy because quantum zero point energy is one of the only things we know of theoretically that has that equation of state, that very strange, it's not the only thing, but it's the main thing that we think of as having this negative equation of state. So how do we know this? How did we find dark energy? Oh, I can't help always dark energy. I make a joke from Star Wars. So that's Count Dooku producing force lightning and he's a dark side user. So call that dark energy. So how do we know that? Um, I don't have time like I did for dark matter to get into the whole the whole spiel like I did for dark matter. So I'm just hitting the highlights here for dark energy. And that is we looked at uh, supernova explosions. We looked at su distant supernova explosions in distant galaxies. And by taking a specific type of supernova called type 1A that we believe has a constant brightness, that means if it's farther away, it's dimmer. And so we use that as a standard candle of brightness in order to estimate the distance and the uh, recessional velocity of, of, of supernova explosions in distant galaxies. Supernovas are so bright that they can outshine an entire galaxy full of stars. And that's why we can see them billions of light years away. We think what happens with a type 1A supernova is that a white dwarf star explodes after sucking matter from a partner like a red giant. It's not the only way you can make a supernova. It's not even the only way you can make type 1A, but that seems to be the most common type. And because white dwarfs are so consistent in their iron and nickel content, that's why this leads to a fairly consistent brightness that can, that can then be used as a standard candle. So that's the astronomy. But just like with dark matter, now let's go down to the, the tabletop level. So if dark energy is the zero point energy, there are things we can do to study this. So the, the, um, we know the zero point energy is real because of Casmer effect experiments, but even decades before Casmer effect, we looked at, we could look at the lamb shift and that the lamb shift is the tiny change in energy level. It's much smaller than the Zeeman effect or the hyperfine structure. It's, um, much smaller effect than the, the hydrino energy levels, things like that. There's a very, very small difference in the energy level of the electron orbiting the hydrogen proton caused by the cl a cloud of virtual particles. So if dark energy is the same thing as zero point energy, it's not necessarily true. But if it is, then we have constantly particle antiparticle pairs zipping in and out of existence and they can produce, even though it's a very small effect, measurable forces, measurable electric charges as with Casimir plates. So this is very potentially very exciting if we could find a way to harness this because one of the ways, not the only way, there are alternative ideas by Bob Rick and others, but um, uh, Eric Davis and Hal Putoff and um, the original Michael Miguel Cubieri paper suggest that if you could harness negative, something that had negative mass energy or negative energy even temporarily, this leads to the ability to develop real life warp drives faster than light or close time like curves. That's time travel to the past, one of my other favorite things. The, the problem is we don't know how to harness this yet on a macroscopic scale. Uh, if we could, this would be an incredible boon to propulsion because this would be the fuel you need for warping space time. But the problem is how do we scale this up? And the other problem is, is there's not even agreement that this is negative energy because that W of minus one, that's a ratio of P to rho. So it's the pressure that is most likely negative, not the mass energy density. So there's a lot of argument in debate, even in within the mainstream scientific community about could you even use dark energy for powering faster than light propulsion or powering your time machine? Because that is still controversial whether there is sufficient negative energy with the proper definition of what that negative energy means to make this work. But I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that I'm hoping that this century that I'm hoping we figure this out. Um, Dark energy, though, I have to say, because it's very important to be open-minded and look at all the possibilities. 
What if dark energy is not zero point energy? What if it's something else? So one of the other ideas is that dark energy is a particle, just like dark matter. And in this instance, this is called the chameleon particles, one of these ideas. And the way you look for the chameleon particle is very similar to the way you test for modified theories of gravity, actually very similar. What you do is you take a tiny, tiny ball of something like uh, quartz and you look for additional forces beyond gravity, electromagnetism that you account for in your detector. And so here are some friends of mine. Actually, I, I heard a talk um, before the pandemic. I invited David Moore to give a talk. I know a lot of these folks like Giorgio Grata. And I love the fact that they started looking at this idea for how do we look for dark energy on the tabletop and not just out in space. And I'm very excited about these new ideas. So they didn't find anything either. If, if they did, trust me, you know, you would have heard it all over the mainstream media. But just like with dark matter, that doesn't mean the idea is wrong. It could mean you just didn't look hard enough and your experiment needs to be rebuilt better, be made, be made to be more sensitive. Now, the, 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 the idea, though, that dark energy is a particle, you can work out some math and see that it would have a mass energy of about 2.4 milli EV if it was a particle. You can do some very simple math to show that. And then that has a characteristic length scale. And I got so excited. This could be completely crazy, but I had to throw it out there. Um, is that I, I, I contacted, you know, um, uh, Hal Pudoff when I realized this calculation, because allegedly there are these so-called metamaterials that are recovered that the government allegedly has. It obviously was, if, if they're real, they're classified. They weren't mentioned in the report uh, from yesterday, but the length scale seems to match perfectly. So I started wondering what if these are metamaterials not for photons, which ordinary metamaterials that we make as human beings are for, what if it's for something more exotic, such as the chameleon particle? What if it's a waveguide for chameleon particles or for dark matter or for axion, you know, as something else? So I had to throw that out there because I just, I, I don't like all these coincidences. I feel like there's something, you know, that we're tasting some part of something really much bigger than us here. But um, we're coming up on the hour, so I'm going to conclude here so that I can start answering the questions. I see that it's piled up to 32 questions, which I hope we can get to all of them, Tim. So in conclusion here, I'll take just two more minutes to conclude then. So 95% of the universe is unknown. And even if that's wrong, let's say we have to modify gravity, that's still a discovery. That's still important. So we cannot claim that science is done and that there are no more patents. There's nothing to discover. There's plenty more to discover. However, one thing I must stress, it's a controversial point. What we do know, we do know very well. So for example, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and discover Einstein was wrong. and Relativity is wrong. It's too late for that because your GPS wouldn't work, et cetera. It's not going to happen. But we do know relativity is partially wrong. Quantum mechanics is partially wrong. It has to be. It's incomplete because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, a theory of everything that everyone can agree on. Like I said, if I had a nickel for every time I got an email about someone's theory of everything, like there's no shortage of ideas. We don't know which one is right. We need to test them in the crucible of ideas with experiments and not just and not just theory. So in my own life, I, fo I focus on looking for dark matter using xenon based experiments. So my second conclusion is if we have all this dark matter and or dark energy out there, this, these are naturally occurring, potentially plentiful propellants for interstellar craft where you don't have to take your propellant with you. So, and you don't even need to do space-time metric engineering necessarily. In the case of dark matter, you don't even need metric engineering potentially. You could use it, quote unquote, the old fashioned way as a propellant and using completely known physics. Now, the downsides of that is how would we harness it since dark matter by definition doesn't interact very often. And what would be the reaction be? It doesn't, it doesn't undergo any, any interactions as far as we know, except for gravity and maybe a very weak interaction where it can bump into nuclei like in the xenon detector, but at a very low probability. So I don't know how we could um, convert this into something useful, but what if there are all kinds of interactions that dark matter has with itself that's called self-interacting dark matter that we don't know about? And it's just like ordinary matter. Dark matter could have a whole slew of interactions that we don't know about and that we haven't discovered. I, I always like to think of what if dark matter is like antimatter or electricity, where we just don't have the imagination 
for what the potential practical applications could be. So in the example of antimatter, you know, in 19, when we discovered in 1933, it was just, just a curiosity, right? We checked the box. But nowadays, we inject people with very small, very safe amounts of antimatter for PET scans, positron emission tomography. And who would have guessed that? Who would have guessed that a century ago, nearly a century ago? And same thing with electricity, which runs our lives. There is a story which, you know, it's probably apocryphal, but there's a story that the King of England visited Michael Faraday in his lab where he's working electromagnetism, asked him, what is electricity good for? And Michael Faraday allegedly said, I don't know your highness, but someday you'll be taxing it. So I hope to live to see the day that someday we'll not only know what dark matter and dark energy are, if they're real, like I said, I'm be trying to be very skeptical and open-minded if they're real, uh, if we know what they are someday, I hope that it becomes a taxable you know, resource that powers our civilization. Um, so I'm gonna stop there because we have 35 questions already. So um, Tim, I'll be happy to take questions now.